All right, let's get underway, please. Open your Bibles. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. If you're new with us, let me just remind you of the chronology of Paul's life as best we know it. We don't know just how old he was. Nowhere in the scriptures does it tell us. But we know when Jesus was born, roughly, because we know when Herod the Great dies, and uh, we know that uh, our Bibles tell us he was still alive when Jesus was born. So we have the dates then that Jesus must have been crucified and raised about the year 29. We believe Paul was confronted by the risen Christ on the road to Damascus a couple of years later, we think, about 31 made his first trip to Jerusalem after that dramatic experience. About four years later, met with the brother of Jesus, James, who had become head of the church in Jerusalem. He worked in Cilicia, and that is the whole territory that includes, sort of right in the center of it, Galatia. Galatia was not one place, remember. It was several little communities. It was a territory, if you would. So, He was there uh, in the Galatia area sometime in that 14-year period between 34 and 48. Uh, Had another big meeting in Jerusalem in 48. Uh, We think he crossed over to Europe for the first time at the Straits of Bosphorus into Philippi, uh, then went from there to Thessalonica and on down the Roman road called the Via Ignatia to Berea, and then south from there to Athens and over to Corinth. He went back to Jerusalem. We think that was about the year 55 or so uh, to take an offering that he had been collecting from the churches he had founded. The Christians in Jerusalem were having an unusually difficult time, and he took an offering to support them. And recall he was arrested there and put in prison in Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea over on the sea, where Pontius Pilate had lived, and uh, that they forgot about him for a couple of years, and finally he was on board a ship uh, after he appealed his case to Rome, since he was a Roman citizen. We think he probably died in Rome, best guess, uh, about 63 or so under the persecutions of Nero. All right. Galatia, here, all right, Jerusalem, Antioch, where they were, believers were first called Christians, Tarsus, Paul's hometown that made him a Roman citizen, uh, Ephesus we know about over here, this was so funny, to me anyway, last Wednesday afternoon late we had our Jewish Christian dialogue group, and we were talking about uh, we were, we've been reading together this fall. I mean, everyone reads and we discuss, is what I mean. Uh, we, we've been reading a book by a rabbi, Rudin, R-U-D-I-N. And this time he was talking about what Jerusalem means to Jews and what Jerusalem means to Christians. And he doesn't always get it right as to what things mean to Christians, but his understanding of what it means. And so the discussion came up about... Uh, when Christians talk about Jerusalem, are they talking about this one? Or are we talking about some kind of heavenly Jerusalem and so on? And the part I was going to tell you is that Father Bill Christ of the Greek Orthodox Church over here, he comes uh, very faithfully to our meetings. And he started talking about uh, where the holy places are for Orthodox and he could not bring himself. I mean, I, I was sitting next to my, my buddy, Rabbi Sherman, and I sort of elbowed him. I said, notice what he's calling that city. He was calling the city here Constantinople. He called over and over and over. He couldn't make himself say Istanbul because it's Constantinople as far as he's concerned. It's still Constantinople. Uh, He's not willing to acknowledge that the Turks have had it for hundreds of years and it is called Istanbul in today's world. We're we're talking about how the ultra-Orthodox Jews still, uh, there are some who really believe uh, if, if they don't, 
reconquer the Temple Mount. God will cause an earthquake or something, and those two mosques are going to self-implode, and then they'll get to rebuild the Temple and have animal sacrifice and so on. Now, those are the ultra-ultra-conservative. And Father Chris was saying, there are only about 1,600 Orthodox Christians left in Constantinople, he said, (laughs) in Constantinople. Do you know how many people there are in Constantinople today? About 18 million. And he said, but the ultra-conservative Greek Orthodox are sure that any day these 1,600 are going to throw out the 18 million and (laughs) retake Constantinople. (laughs) It was so funny. Still calling it Constantinople after all these many years. All right, chapter 5. Paul has has uh, been gone from Galatia for a time, and folks have come in after him who are trying to convince these new Christians, many of them Gentiles, of course, that they have to first be good, observant Jews um, by being circumcised, eating kosher, and observing Sabbath. Let's pray. God, we are doing our best to understand what Paul was saying to the churches of Galatia. We know he had no knowledge of Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Boston Avenue Methodist Church, no knowledge of any one of us, but we believe the things he was writing to the churches of Galatia are true for us as well. We find truth here, things that have been true forever and that Paul stated them wonderfully well, sometimes in ways that are difficult for us to understand. So we ask you to help us, and we offer our best effort in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, you can't jump into chapter 5 without remembering context here. Paul did not write in chapter and verse. We need to keep reminding ourselves none of the biblical writers wrote in chapter and verse. Uh, They wrote, and years later, we needed some way to help each other find the same place, so versification took place much, much later, hundreds of years later. So, um, Paul's just writing a letter, and in writing this letter, you can't jump into chapter 5 without remembering the sentences just before it. So this is what he had been talking about where we left off last Sunday. He was talking about children of Abraham. And remember, he's been saying that these Gentiles, modern-day Turks live here, these Gentile Christians were children of Abraham if they had faith in the one true God, Israel's God, as did Abraham and Sarah that Abraham and Sarah were counted right with God because they trusted God. And so even though these Gentiles in Galatia are not blood kin to Jews, we don't have the same DNA that you could measure in a laboratory, we too can be children of Abraham and Sarah if we trust the way they did. And then he used the analogy, and he tells you, This is an allegory, and he even says it, so you're not confused here. He realized this isn't literally true, but it's an example. That is, Ishmael was a son of Abraham, just because Abraham had sex with a slave girl named Hagar. Isaac was a gift of God. A mother who was too old in their parlance, to have a baby. Uh, She was past change of life, should not have been able to conceive, did conceive, because God enabled her to conceive. God made this happen. So one was a child of the flesh, he says, and one was a child of the promise. All right. So he jumps right in also, but you have to keep remembering that before that he was using an example of little children who have a nanny or a guardian who teach them how to do what's right, to avoid doing what's wrong. 
And then one day they come of age and they are no longer under this the tutelage of a nanny. They have become heirs. What came to them from mother and father uh, now is a gift to them and they start functioning as adults. Okay, he's using all of that to talk about the role of Torah and the role of Jesus of Nazareth. That Torah was like a nanny, like a disciplinarian that told us what we ought to do in the Ten Commandments and what we ought not to do. And that if we did the good things and avoided doing the bad things, our community would, would thrive. We would get along well with each other if we would do what he told us to and not do what he told us not to do. But, but that still nobody got that perfectly right all the time. And then God decided to reveal himself in a new wonderful way in flesh and blood, in Mary's child, Jesus. And that we were no longer enslaved to Torah. That's his terminology, enslaved. He means by that having to count, have we done this, have we not done that, have we done this, have we not done that, but that we know ourselves right by only one standard. We either trust the goodness of God to set us right, or we don't. We either have come to faith in him or we have not. Okay, he says then, if you Gentiles know yourselves to be children of Abraham just because you have faith in Abraham and Sarah's God, then why would you want to re-enslave yourself to all these... He doesn't mean that the Torah is unimportant, uh, that it should be ignored, but there are things in the Torah that he's been taught, I, I turn, turn the page, but back at the Apostolic Council, he was assured these Gentiles would not have to be circumcised for religious purposes, they would not have to eat kosher, and they would not have to stop all commerce and everything at sundown on Friday. Okay, then we can start. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And he means you don't have to do those three things. I don't care what these people are telling you. You don't have to do those three things. I went to the Apostolic Council, led by the brother of Jesus himself, and they said you don't have to do these things. So why let these people who've come in after me convince you that you do? Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, and of course here again, now you and I are not into this health issue at this point. It's perfectly fine for us to have our little boys circumcised if we believe that is the better way of health. He's not talking about that. He doesn't know anything about that. He's talking about strictly a religious ceremony. So the debate that's been going on in Germany right now, I don't know if you've been following this, you would think Germany would not want to go there. After their history of Nazism, and now they have great numbers of Muslims who also circumcise their little boys because they believe they're children of Abraham, and Abraham circumcised, they think they have to be circumcised too. I mean, when we were in, in, in Germany again just three years ago, uh, I found that I could buy Coca-Colas and things much cheaper at little tiny hole-in-the-wall markets run by Turks, Muslim Turks. Uh, Germany and other countries in Western Europe have let them come in to do the grunt work they don't want to do, and now they're having lots of babies and the population's growing. So Germany has a fair number of Muslims and they still have some Jews and their legislature votes no more circumcision. Oh, 
gee, they have they've been having it. I mean, they have enough problems with the French all the time, and now they want to take on the Jews and the Muslims both at the same time over this issue. So they're relenting. Well, okay, for religious ceremonies or whatever. That's not the argument Paul's having. He doesn't know anything about that. He's strictly talking about religious circumstances, nothing to do with health. So that's not the debate for him. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. That is, you go right back to what we've been for a thousand years. Once again, I testify to every man, and this was the big argument, see, do these 50-year-old Turks have to let these strangers get at them with their little knives? Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged then to obey the entire Torah. Okay, you want to take on those three things? Let me give you the other 436. That's what he's saying. You who want to be justified, that is, set right with God by Torah, have cut yourselves off from Christ. Notice here, folks, this is interesting. If you read it in Greek, it's interesting. These people who want to cut off something are going to make you be cut off from Christ. It's the same word. It's the same word. He knows it. He uses it purposely here. So if you're going to let them cut one, guess what? You've cut something else. You've cut yourselves off from the grace of Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Grace is just offered to you freely. Will you accept it or not? For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of right standing. Okay, righteousness is right standing. How? We receive God's gift. When Martin Luther read this, along with the letter to the Romans, is when he screamed, Sola fide, sola gratia. Wow, I don't have to get up at four o'clock and kneel on a cold stone floor and pray so God will love me? He will let me pray after breakfast and still love me? It changed his whole life. I can get married. I can be a father. That's what happened to Luther 500 years ago when he read these words again. I don't have to submit to disciplines that other people have imposed on me if I've really become a child of God by God's grace that I've come to know in Christ. For And here, verse 6, I had a sermon that I used to preach. When I was in Houston, let me go back a step, I went out twice a month to do a series of, of sermons, like our Barton Clinton Gordy, twice a month. Dr. Charles Allen believed that we could build a Sunday night service if I was willing to go, 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 go. And that people from all over East Texas in particular were moving to Houston. Okay. From the rural areas, they were moving to Houston. And so if I preached in Center, Texas, or St. Augustine, or Lufkin, or Longview, or Tyler, somebody's grandchild just moved to Houston from there and they'd say, you need to go to First Methodist on Sunday night and hear Dr. Biggs. That was the idea. So, he said, we will free you to go out twice a month. And I did. And one of the sermons that I preached, one of those that you could wake me at 3 a.m. and I could do this sermon, was right here in verse 6. I preached it here shortly after I came. I haven't repeated any sermons here, so you haven't heard it in about 32 years. But this was one of my standards when I came here. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Okay, stop a second, though, and think about this. What is he saying? Okay, with circumcision, if this is a symbol of something you see. You are set right by the way you do something. 
to each other or have somebody else do something to you. Christians often still divide themselves by how they do baptism. I mean, there are churches right here in Tulsa, if you were to decide to join one of them, they would insist that you be immersed because you haven't really been baptized to them. I couldn't believe the United Methodist Reporter a couple of weeks ago did a, two pages of church, Methodist churches now that have decided to start immersing. This is not our tradition at all. It is not our tradition. And you know what? They're giving in to their neighbors. They're simply just, they rather really give in than fight. All these folks around them, they're saying, you've got to be immersed, you've got to be immersed. Okay, we'll immerse you too. You want to be immersed? Lovers Lane in Dallas, they've got a fancy little fountain. It looks like a fish tank, and they've started immersing people in there. Because uh, they've got really conservative neighbors. These guys, mostly guys, start these non-denominational churches, and they're the only way, the only way, and you've got to be immersed. So I talked about that. There, there are people who have almost religious wars over how communion is served. How communion is served. Um, when I grew up, a little country church, we didn't have fancy brassware. Uh, communion Sunday, it was a, a dinner plate and Nabisco crackers broken, about four pieces each square. You got about a fourth of a Nabisco cracker. Um, when I came here, uh, this church was using the little things that some deridedly call chiclets, okay? Those tiny little hard, hard square things. They have wonderful shelf life. You can keep them 50 years and, you know, because rats won't eat them. You know, they, they, they just, they're there forever. But I didn't feel that was representative at all. And so when I came here, one of the things I wanted to change, first of all, by going to a wafer, I wanted to affirm our kinship to the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church. I wanted to affirm our relation. And I, I told you all about that 32 years ago. When we were going to change, and we were going to go to a different kind of bread, Okay, we were going to go to a different kind of bread, and we were going to the wafer because it affirmed our relationship with Roman Catholicism and with Anglicanism. The Wesleys never left the Anglican Church. Okay, but the other thing I insisted upon was we're going to have unleavened wafers to affirm our relationship to Judaism. Our Holy Communion was born out of the Passover observance, and that is strictly unleavened. So, the Methodist Church didn't make unleavened wafers, but the Catholics do, and they would sell to us, and so we, you know, tried several different kinds, and decided, okay, this one is, is the better one for us, and we started using the wafers. Now, if you come to other than Sunday morning at 11 o'clock communion, you may see that sometimes we do use a whole loaf of bread. There's a beautiful symbolism to that, of course, um, that I am one loaf, and from this one loaf we all partake. I don't think there's only one way to do it. Uh, you know, there is more than one acceptable way, we United Methodists think. Um, some traditions, of course, use real wine, and we Methodists, most of us anyway, don't pretend that Jesus didn't drink wine, we simply say there are people in every congregation who have uh, a propensity to be alcoholic if they use alcohol. And some who are really fighting a daily battle not to uh, participate in any way in alcohol. Did you know that the Welch Grape Juice Company was founded by a Methodist preacher? It was. A Methodist preacher named Welch started making grape juice that his, so his congregation could have communion without using fermented wine. And it grew and grew and grew. But that's the way Welch's grape juice got started. It was for Methodists, by a Methodist preacher, uh, to have unfermented juice of the grape. Now, in some parts of the United States, United Methodists use uh, wine. 
In other areas of the country, we don't. We still use the unfermented juice of the grape. What I'm saying is that we have to, to be careful that the way we baptize or the way we do communion becomes so absolute that that's the only way that God can work through. It's the only way God is willing to work. So you see, that is submitting again to circumcision. Spiritually, you're deciding you have to do something a certain way. Okay. But he says also uncircumcision doesn't matter anymore. And as I continued, when, when I came here, I said to the Pastor Parish Relations Committee, I mean, they knew about me because I preached somewhere every other week. But when I came here, they were concerned about my being gone too much. And so I said right up front, I will do no more than one series a month. As long as I'm your pastor, I will be in this pulpit every Sunday morning, unless I'm really on vacation. I turned down the opportunity to preach on Sunday morning at Highland Park Church in Dallas, which is right on the campus of SMU, because it was Sunday morning. And I told the past parish relations committee I would not be in anybody else's church on Sunday morning unless I was on vacation. And when I was on vacation, I wouldn't be preaching. I turned down the opportunity to preach again at First Methodist Church Houston on Sunday morning. I told him I'd come Sunday night, not Sunday morning, because I, I would not give up my pulpit on Sunday morning to help somebody else build a crowd in his or her church. Okay, so I took that seriously, and I, I promised I will not do more than one series a month and never on Sunday morning. I'll start on Sunday night, not Sunday morning. And I've, I've, I've kept my promise for 32 years. Absolutely, I've kept my promise for 32 years. But when I would go out and do these series and preach this sermon from this text, then I would talk about uncircumcision. And here was my example I would use. We arrived in Tulsa the end of August, 1980. All right. My first few days, I had budget committee. Uh, we had to talk about salaries for all the staff people. But we also had nominations committee. And I looked at the forms. In this church, we needed 853 people to take leadership roles into the new year. And I didn't know a name. How tough is that? To come up with 853 names when I knew none. So I started meeting with staff. And then after you know going over, and I, I, I kept saying to them, you're going to have to help me here. I'm going to hold you responsible, staff members, for whether I see progress in your area of ministry. So you better ask me for the people you need to help you do your job as effectively as possible. So if you're related to any particular work area, you need to go over that list carefully. And by discipline in the Methodist Church, the pastor presides over the nominations committee. So it was my job, but I said to them, I'm going to hold you accountable for whether this, this particular job gets done. So you better tell me, uh, she's not helping me, he's not helping me, she's not helping me, he's not helping me. I need this one and this one this one this one. I will help you eliminate people that are no longer helping you and help you get the people you need. I need you to tell me who they are. And so we went through 853 positions, 853 names, and then I met the committee. And I said, these are just suggestions. You are the committee. You can strike any one of these ideas. You can add to any one of them you want to. And I made them go with me after prayer over 853 names. But then the next big job is, I turn that report over to my secretary, and she has to write 853 letters and ask these people if they will serve. Because we didn't jump ahead of the committee and ask people before the committee agreed to them. No, now they had to be notified. And so I wrote a very careful letter and said, the committee has met, the staff has met, we've prayed, we've talked and prayed and talked, and we feel led to ask you to chair the committee on whatever for next year. 
I want you to prayerfully consider whether God is wanting you to do this. And if I don't hear from you within three weeks, gave them a date, you will be nominated at the charge conference on November, elected and start to serve January 1. I could imagine 853 people telling me, no thanks. But I still remember one guy calling me and saying, what sort of letter is this? See, I was very new here. People didn't know me well at all. What sort of letter is this? You tell me you have prayed and you feel led to ask me to do this job and then I'm supposed to pray and then call you and say, God told me he didn't want me to do this. I said, I hoped you would feel that way. I hoped you would feel that as we feel led to ask you to do this, that you feel God is wanting you to do it. But when I would go out to preach, I'd say, you see, there are some that say, I'm not doing it. I got a new lake house up on Grand Lake. I got a new grandbaby in Oklahoma City. I've got uh, retirement now and I can be gone 60% of the time. I don't have to. You see, uncircumcision is the attitude. I don't have to do anything. I'm a child of grace. You see, Paul says neither of these amounts to fiddly doodle I mean, the sense that you are had bound to be baptized a certain way or you didn't really get baptized. You can take communion only one way or you didn't really experience the presence of Christ in the broken bread and the shared blood. And then the attitude that I don't have to. I'm saved by grace. Paul didn't believe that that was valid either. I mean, he took seriously Jesus saying, pick up your cross, come and follow me. So in one sense you're free, in another sense you're not free. Charles Wesley understood this. He wrote a hymn we're singing. Make me a captive Lord, and then I shall be free understand? I'm not a captive to doing these three things these Judaizers want us to do, but I am captive to the one who's given me his love, that I now need to follow him. I need to be as concerned about his other children, my brothers and sisters, as I know how to be, like he was. See? All right, so that this sermon had four points, of course. Circumcision no longer matters. Uncircumcision no longer matters. You know, the sense you don't have to do anything. What does matter? In another point in the letter, he has this same sentence in Greek. In Christ Jesus, circumcision no longer matters, nor does uncircumcision. But here it says... Faith working through love, the other verse says, but a new creation. So the third point was, you know what matters? A new creation. And that new creation is one who has come to understand there is one God who created the heavens and the earth. We'll start, we're still learning just how he did that. But we affirm there was one, he did it all. And that that one knows my name, really cares what I had for breakfast, really cares whether I'm having good things happen to me or grieving with me if something bad's breaking my heart. Okay? If I trust that that's so, that his eye is on the sparrow and he also cares for me. I'm a new creature. Paul believed, I'm a new creature. So can you be. And if you feel you are made new by the love of God extended to you, then what do you do? Faith working through love. 
So faith is receiving the gift, and now you do agape. I mean, that's how simple and how profound it is. Now you do agape. And agape, of course, I think, I'm indebted to Dr. Scott Peck, who wrote years ago, The Road Less Traveled. He said it a little more helpful to me than any seminar professor I ever had when he said, it's a willingness to put yourself out for the well-being of another. I, I, and I said, by George, that's what the professors were trying to say. A willingness to put yourself out for the well-being of another. So this old hidebound legalism that says there's only one way to be baptized or take communion, those are our only two sacraments, Dr. Swafford and others in the Roman Catholic Church could say, well, there are other sacraments and they too have ways to do them and ways not to do them. And I have definite feelings about the ways to do things. It's become fashionable in communion, for example. I go to our orders meeting, elders of the Methodist Church, and some of these preachers, I don't know, maybe they've been taught or something. They think it's important that when I come up to take communion, moves on. Jesus died for you, and so on, so on. I don't want them to call my name. Because it's not about him or her or and me. It's about the Lord and me. The Roman Catholic Church understood this. That is, it's not about the priest. The priest is merely the instrument. It's about you and the Lord. When we sound that chime up in the ceiling, it's about the one who was crucified and has been raised coming to the table and waiting for you. I'm just moving along the rail. You see? So I have definite ideas about how these things ought to be done, but I'm not willing to say there's only one way that they can be done effectively. I just have my own preferences and, and, and my own beliefs. So, don't submit to circumcision, the belief that there's only one way. And if you get this done, then everything else works out fine. Or uncircumcision says, I'm free, I don't have to do anything. I have no responsibilities whatsoever. No, nope, put those two aside. But a new creation and faith that works through love, yeah, they really matter. Okay. Yes, sir. It's, it maybe it's just fashionable, but anyway, the Catholic Church now has begun, and a lot of the parish churches and the diocese of Tulsa are emerging adults. Have they? Yes, and I'm, I'm in the St. Bernard Parish, the Monty in Dallas. Yes. And the last two that I've attended was bringing adults in the church. They walk right in, and when they built that new sanctuary, there is a baptistry. Really? Dr. Swafford is saying that, that at his Roman Catholic Church they are now immersing some. There is a symbolism, of course, of going under the water, uh, being buried with Christ and being raised out of the water into new life. It is a meaningful symbol, for sure. Historically, um, I mean, Gail and I have been to some wonderful museums and some of the great museums of the world. And the oldest paintings we have of Jesus' baptism, he's standing in water uh, a little below his waist with John pouring the water over his head, not sousing him. But anyway, you can tell by the word sousing, it's not my favorite way. <laughs> I immersed two women one day, and I promised God if he would get me out of that, that stock pond, I would never do that again. <clears throat> I think I've told you about that. I was very young and had very little experience. I'd never seen anybody immersed in my life. The little Methodist church I grew up in, we didn't immerse anybody. We scooped up a handful of water and placed on the head of the believer, and that's the way I was baptized. But these two women were coming from a Baptist church, and it wasn't enough that they'd been baptized. Now they wanted to be rebaptized. And nowadays, I just tell them, I will not do it. I will not rebaptize somebody who's been baptized. But I didn't know I could do that back then, that I could just say, I'm not doing it. So, in this smaller of my two churches, where we averaged about 16 on Sunday, literally 16 people, this mother and daughter, but both of them adults, wanted me to immerse them. I said, 
but we don't have a baptistry. And one of the farmers said, i got a stock pond at my house. And these women said, that'll be fine. And so we went to the stock pond on Sunday afternoon. And uh, it looked snaky at best, but I waded out in the water. And then what I discovered, of course, was that mud was about 12 inches deep. So it was hard to stand up in this muddy, muddy bog. And then these two women came out into the water. And do you remember in 1959 how fashionable nylon was? They had worn nylon dresses. And when they got wet, there were few secrets left for anybody. I remember one of the men in the church, when these women came up out of the water, he was putting towels around them as fast as he could. And I said, Lord, if you will ever get me out of this stock pond, I will not do this again. And I have not uh, ever, ever again. So, anyway, that's the way I understand verse 6. Let's go on. Paul says, you were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth, meaning what he had taught them before? Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you, that is, from me. A little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. I'm confident about you in the Lord that you will not think otherwise. But whoever it is that's confusing you will pay the penalty. But, my friends, why am I still being persecuted if I'm still preaching circumcision? And he wasn't. In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. And then here's a strong little verse. I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. And that's what it says in Greek. Uh, it's the same little word for the cut, and he's literally in Greek. I hope their knives slip and they just do terrible things to each other. Verse 13. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. And that's what he means by uncircumcision, that you don't owe anybody anything. You just get to do it if it feels good, to quote our baby boomer friends. But through agape, become slaves. This is the word douloi. It can mean servant or slave. Don't think you owe nothing to anyone. Instead, understand yourself. Remember, he, Jesus told his disciples, and Paul, of course, didn't get to know the flesh and blood Jesus, but he told his disciples, I'm among you as one who waits on tables. Remember? That's what Paul means here, of course. Through agape, become servants to one another, slaves. For the whole of Torah is summed up in a single commandment. And what did Jesus say? He gave two. He gave them the uh, Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You must have no other God but him. You must love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is sort of like the first. You shall love your neighbors yourself. Well, Paul says you can sum it up in one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Did you know that out of the 22 largest religions in the world, and only three of them are monotheistic, one God, only the Jews first, then the Christians, then the Muslims, say there's just one God. The other 19 are polytheistic, but 21 out of the 22 biggest in the world, Hindus, Buddhists, and all have a statement almost identical to this one. Somehow God has brought us all to this one thing, if we could just love your neighbor as yourself. Do to the other as you want that one to do to you. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. 
wasn't it Confucius that said if you set out to settle the scores by revenge, you should dig two graves. The one you're out to kill and yourself dig two graves. If you keep biting each other, you will finally consume each other, Paul says. Instead, live by the Spirit, I say. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh, these appetites that can get you into such trouble. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit. What the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to Torah. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. And here he sort of lists those latter parts of the Ten Commandments, not identically. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the world of the flesh, and we're to move from that world into the world of the spirit. And he tells you what that looks like. By contrast, he says, the fruit of the spirit is agape, joy, shalom, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no Torah against such things. In other words, all of these Torah would agree with as well. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another, but doing all these other good things, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and so on. Okay, do you have any questions about any of chapter 5? Anybody unhappy about chapter 5? I want to contend with Paul. I'll see if I can represent him if you do. Yes. Okay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, yes, I'm following you now, Maureen. Thanks. Yes. Uh, her question was, uh, in our dialogue group, when we talked about how do Jews see Jerusalem and how do Christians see Jerusalem, well, guess what? Jews don't see it eye to eye, and Christians don't see it eye to eye either. Uh, for example, the Jews who are in our Jewish-Christian dialogue group uh, when we get into this discussion of how they envision Zionism playing out, what, is, what does Jerusalem become in the future? And you, you do have those, uh, the Hasidim, uh, and, who really do believe one day they will rebuild the temple on Mount Moriah, the mosque will be gone, and they will reinstate the priesthood and the sacrificial system. That's far, of course, from where our two rabbis would be. There is a reason why uh, Rabbi Sherman and his congregation named their building the temple. Because it says to their community, we're not waiting for the temple in Jerusalem. The temple is in Tulsa. And whenever you go to any community in the United States, or Europe for that matter, and you see something called uh, Temple Beth Israel or Temple Israel or whatever, they have different names, but if it says the word temple, it means we're not expecting to rebuild the one on Mount Moriah. 
they are fine with the mosques that are up there. As long as they have access to the western wall and so on as being a very sacred place. Uh, Rabbi Sherman is not losing sleep over the two mosques at the top of the hill. So they have very different ideas. Okay, so do Christians. Our very first trip to Israel was in 1983. And uh, we had only been to Europe once the summer before. So we were not world travelers. And uh, we let someone else plan our trip to Israel for us. And we ended up with a guide. I've told you this story, but it it illustrates it nonetheless. We uh, had a guide who was a sergeant major in the Israeli army, uh, but had certain amounts of furlough time during the year, and he guided other groups during that time, and he and his wife had a restaurant in Jerusalem. Well, this guy believed Israel was the greatest place on the planet And so anything we had for breakfast or lunch or dinner, it was the best that God had ever made. I mean, the oranges are sweeter in Israel than anywhere else in the world. The grapefruit, bigger and finer than anywhere else in the world. Nobody grows dates like they do in Israel. Nobody grows tomatoes like they do. This went on and on and on. And our people got tired of hearing that because they think they're pretty good tomatoes in the United States of America if you know where to go and look for them. And so they started sort of sniping at him a little bit. And one night after dinner, uh, everybody, you know, had finished their meal at the hotel and they were on their way to their rooms. And he wanted to talk to me. And he said, why do your people not like me? I said, what do you mean? Well, they took issue with my saying, you know, that we have the greatest dates in the world and the best tomatoes. And I said, well, they think America is a pretty special place. They love their country uh, probably about as much as you love yours. And he said, well, the group I had in here last week, I mean, gee, everything I said, they applauded. They applauded. They applauded. And I said, who are you guiding? Where were they from? And he was guiding a group led by Hal Lindsey, who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. And I said, oh, gee, do you know the difference between Hal Lindsey's group and my group? Hal Lindsey is a part of this group that wants Israel to do really well because his understanding of the Bible is that when Israel does really well, Jesus is going to come back and send you to hell. And my people, who think your tomatoes may not be any better than the ones we have in Oklahoma, think you are their brother. And that God has never revoked his covenant with you. And that they expect to be with you in God's eternity. He said, really? I said, really? He said, thank you very much. And he went off to bed, you know. So, yeah, we have Christians who believe Jesus will establish the kingdom in Jerusalem. But all the Christians will come and reign there. We have some Christians who believe that. That's not what you and I believe, of course. We believe God is present in one place as much as another. And if we try hard, he'll help one place grow good tomatoes and another place to grow good tomatoes. We are not looking for one place. But it's interesting because one of the people in our dialogue group is a Mormon. Where do you think Jesus is going to come back? For Mormons. No, not not Utah, but close. I mean, close to that idea. Now, he's coming to Missouri. Missouri is where Joseph Smith got the gold plates. And the Mormons own several thousand acres of land where Joseph Smith is supposed to have seen the golden plates and translated the Book of Mormon. And Jesus is coming there. And the Mormons are going to gather there and build the biggest temple in the world there in Missouri. Yeah, so we have different ideas, different ideas about, you know, Jerusalem. And I was trying to say to Rabbi Sherman, I mean, you, this, this uh, Rabbi Rudin, who'd, who'd written the book, was trying to say what Christians, why they come to Israel, you know, what they're experiencing there. 
And Rabbi Sherman said, is that really what you're... I mean, he said it to, to all of us who are Christian and on the group. Is that what y'all are looking for? And I said, that's not what I'm looking for, Charles. And I said, let me, let me tell you about our group. I mean, certainly our closest tie to Israel emotionally is that this is where Jesus lived. This is where the most significant things in Jesus' life occur. Well, all the events of his physical life occurred in modern-day Israel, in that piece of real estate. But I said, we spend almost half as much time dealing with sites that are significant to you as we do that are significant to us, because your scriptures are also our scriptures. And I said, so we go to Masada, and uh, Masada is nothing about Christians. Um, we spend nearly a whole day going down to Masada and down to En Gedi where David and Saul you know, were chasing each other. And we went up to Don this past year to Dan and, and saw where Nehemiah built the temple up there and so on. And we go to, uh, well, any number of places that, that are significant Jewish places, Old Testament for us places, not just New Testament. So, I said, so Charles, I said, we... We went up Mount Carmel, and Elijah wasn't a Christian. We don't claim he was a Christian, but that's a wonderful story of God's power and grace and so on. So they differ, you know, we differ, but uh, we have a, a good discussion anyway. Well, thanks. We have handbells playing for you at 11, Dr. Susan Pensera. Uh, I'll be right back to preach, so don't rush off if you haven't been to church yet. <laughs>